Today's A Day in History video is brought to you by Wondrium. If you haven't already subscribed to our growing channel, please do. If you already have, you might have seen our video, The Unspeakable Things Pope John XII Did During His Reign. John XII was a power and money hungry sex addict who lied to almost every ally he had and nearly bankrupted the Catholic Church. Bad, huh? Well, get ready because John wasn't the only lousy pope. Let's meet Benedict IX, one of the youngest popes in history and the only man to ever be pope twice. Wondrium has a new home for the great courses and more. Today's A Day in History video is brought to you by Wondrium. And if you're the history buff we know you are, after watching our video, we'll know you'll visit Wondrium. New lectures and documentaries that will excite your mind and imagination. Wondrium brings leading minds in a variety of fields to your living room, delivering lectures and instruction on history, science, literature, math, architecture, the arts, cooking, astronomy, and much else. It has thousands of hours of informational and instructional content, brought to you by professors and great thinkers from around the world, on almost any topic you can imagine. Naturally, the Vikings rank high on our list of interests, and Wondrium does not disappoint with its plethora of resources dedicated to these legendary Norsemen. Our favorite was Jarls and Sea Kings of Norway, which told us more about the important but seldom mentioned Harald Clark, a powerful Danish pagan chieftain who in the early 800s controlled much of Denmark, lost it, and received help from the Frankish Christian king, Louis the Pious, son of Charlemagne in getting his lands back. We at A Day in History produce videos on some of the crazier issues in human history, and Wondrium is where we discover a lot of these fascinating subjects. To make sure Wondrium is right for you, there is also a free trial, which you can sign up for at wondrium.com forward slash a day in history. When a historian writes the church, he or she only means one thing, the Catholic Church. For many hundreds of years, the Catholic Church was really the only Christian church in Europe, or at least in Western, Central, and Northern Europe. In Russia and the Byzantine Empire, which included much of the Balkan Peninsula, the Orthodox faith held sway. Both the Pope in Rome and the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church in Constantinople worked tirelessly to make theirs the only Christian church, but despite much bloodshed and treasure spent, neither one could gain the upper hand in the others' territories. You see, aside from being religious leaders with great power and influence, the Popes and Patriarchs were often men who wielded great political power as well. For many centuries in the West, the Pope controlled not only the Vatican and the Church, but was the political chief of what were known as the Papal States, a swath of land across Italy from Rome to the Adriatic Sea. At times, the Papal States shrunk in size due to a weak Pope or military defeat, and at times, the Church's land in Italy grew. Aside from this, the Popes controlled the Church and to varying degrees depending on distance, influence, and politics, received money in the form of tithes and other payments from the churches and cathedrals throughout Western Europe. In other words, the church was incredibly rich, at least for much of history. That meant that the Pope, as head of the church, was incredibly rich too. In our most recent video about the papacy, we told you of the man many consider the worst Pope in history, John XII. Among the many things that John did was nearly bankrupt the Catholic Church. Think about that for a moment. Today, the Catholic Church is worth billions and billions of dollars. It was not much different when John was Pope, and he spent, or allowed to be spent, nearly all the Church's money. A large part of these expenditures were spent on military campaigns, booze, women and gambling, all decidedly un-Pope things. In the early 11th century, another pope did his best to take the title of worst pope in history away from John XII. Though their reigns as pope were separated by 100 years, Pope John XII and Benedict were members of the same extended family, the Tusculum clan of Rome, who liked to brag that they had been related to the Caesars. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but they were powerful in the early Middle Ages. So powerful that they could, and did, get popes elected and appointed. 
If you saw our video on John the 12th, you know that in his time, the people of Rome, not the College of Cardinals or a panel of bishops, elected the Pope. The people of Rome were easy to bribe, and the many families vying to put one of their own on the papal throne spent huge sums of money to do just that. If they succeeded, the payoff was huge, but for at least a century, the leaders of the Tusculum clan were the power brokers in Rome. When a pope takes office, he selects a papal name. Benedict comes from the Latin word for blessed, but Benedict's real name was Theophylactus, which means either the guardian of God or guarded by God. Either way, with a name like that and a family like his, Benedict seemed almost destined to be pope. And he was. Three times. Benedict was the only man in history to hold the office of pope on more than one occasion. More about that in a moment. By the way, Theophylactus is not as an unusual name as you might think. Throughout the Spanish-speaking world, the name Theophilo or forms of it are still quite popular. Benedict was born around 1012. His father was Alberic III, Count of Tusculum. John XII's father was Alberic II. Aside from his distant relative Pope John XII, Benedict was nephew to two other popes. Benedict VIII, 1012 to 1024, and John the 19th, 1024 to 1032. After the death of John the 19th, Alberic and the Tusculum spread their money around in Rome and succeeded in having Theophylactus, now Benedict elected Pope. Okay, so we all know that the winners write history, and in the end, Benedict the 9th was not a winner. During and after his papacies, the enemies of Benedict and the Tusculum clan launched a smear campaign against him. You think the politicians of today use smear tactics and name calling? Okay, they do, and it's pretty bad, but so far, they have not accused a pope of bestiality, and that's what many of Benedict's none too friendly biographers have said about him, among other things. Benedict's first time as pope lasted for 12 years, a decent period, unless you're a pope whose term in office is life. And since Benedict became pope around the age of 20, he had a good stretch of time as pontiff ahead of him, even considering the shorter lifespans of the Middle Ages. During those 12 years, Benedict partied like it was 1999, or rather 1099. It's a song by Prince, check it out. He angered or offended just about everyone in Rome at one time, and that took some doing, for despite being the center of the Catholic world, Rome was known for its relatively liberal lifestyles. However, it was becoming increasingly common for priests and other clerics to take a vow of celibacy. Chastity did not become church doctrine until the later 1000s, when Pope Gregory VII commanded it. Even then, many priests, bishops, and popes ignored the policy. So, Benedict was not required to remain chaste, but it was encouraged by the church. He didn't care. Moreover, it's widely believed that Benedict was homosexual, or at the very least bisexual. Even that was not as unusual as you might think. Well, it was for a pope, but generally speaking, if a man kept things to himself and out of the public eye, homosexuality was tolerated. Except when it wasn't. For instance, when the church or some political leader decided to denounce it and persecute anyone who engaged in it. Among the military class in Rome, even after the fall of the empire, homosexuality was relatively common. But not among popes. Other pontiffs had engaged in relations with other men, such as Julius II, Paul II, Sixtus IV, Leo X, and Julius III. But these men had long-standing relationships with other men, except for Paul II, who was rumored to have died while having sex with a page. Benedict was rumored to have engaged in it openly, randomly, and with more than one at a time. This was one of the main reasons why Benedict had so many enemies. In more recent times, some historians have suggested that Benedict was the victim of a smear campaign only, and that his homosexuality or his homosexual acts were alleged and never proved. But even these historians agreed that Benedict was not a shining example of moral rectitude. In 1036, after four years as pope, Benedict's enemies, who accused him not only of homosexuality but of orgies with both men and women, single and married, became so threatening that he was forced from Rome. 
Think about it for a moment. It's not an easy thing to force the Pope from Rome. He is considered the representative of Christ on earth and infallible. Moreover, the people of Rome elected him, at least through the bishops. So there must have been something to the rumors, at least to a degree. Benedict sought the help of the powerful military defender of the Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Emperor Conrad III, who ushered him back into Rome, forcibly removed some of Benedict's enemies and placed him back in the Vatican. In September 1044, the rumors of Benedict's rampant sexual escapades, including adultery, orgies, homosexuality, and bestiality, forced him out of Rome. He was replaced by Sylvester III, who was pope for just two months before Benedict gathered military forces and marched on the city. Sylvester and his supporters wisely fled, and in April 1045, Benedict was pope again. Benedict may have been many things, but he wasn't stupid. In only one month, he decided to give up the papacy again, and he doubted he had the strength to resist them. What's more, he planned on marrying his first cousin. Though this wasn't unusual then and is legal in some US states and countries today, it was not something the popes did. Not wanting to leave the Vatican cheaply, in May 1045, Benedict entered into negotiations with his priest and godfather, who became Pope Gregory VI after Benedict sold the position to him for 1,000 pounds of silver and a guarantee that he would receive the tithes of Great Britain as a salary. Even though this was unheard of, the new pope was welcomed, mainly because he wasn't Benedict. A year later, Benedict decided that retirement wasn't for him. Maybe it was the power. Perhaps it was the sex. Maybe his marriage didn't work out. History books are silent about this. Maybe he spent all of his money partying. Perhaps he wanted to issue himself a pardon. So he gathered a small army once again and marched on Rome. Though he took over the Vatican and ran things for a year, it was his godfather that everyone recognized as the real pope. The other former pope, Sylvester III, claimed that he had been illegally deposed and was still the pope himself. By this time, Holy Roman Emperor Conrad III had died, and Henry III took his place. Political figures and clergy from all over Europe begged Henry to do something about the situation in Rome, and he did. Henry called together the Council of Sutri in December 1046. Henry encouraged Gregory VI to give up the position he had bought from Benedict, for purchasing and selling church offices was a sin known as simony. He also deposed Benedict and Sylvester III with the support of important bishops. While Sylvester was at the Council of Sutri and had no choice but to give in, Benedict was not present and sent messages to Sutri, refusing to give up the Vatican. No matter, Henry III had thousands of troops. Benedict did not. Henry placed Clement II on the papal throne. Unfortunately, Clement II died in October 1047, after less than two years in office. Guess what? I'll bet you know. Benedict came back. He seized the Pope's residence, the Lateran Palace, and proclaimed himself Pope for a third time. It took nine months for Henry III to cross the Alps with another army and forcibly remove Benedict again. In his place was the popular Damasus II. Benedict was tried for simony and excommunicated from the church, never to return. No one knows what happened to Benedict after his third time as Pope. Surprisingly, he wasn't jailed or burned at the stake or some other nasty medieval method of execution. Instead, it's widely believed that he exiled himself to the small town and monastery of Rotaferrata, southeast of Rome, where he repented for his sins and died around 1056. Benedict might have died a lonely penitent monk, but at least he had some exciting memories to keep him company. If you like this video, you're a sinner. We'll forgive you though if you like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.